Welcome on stage, Richard Ekebus. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, it's my first time to do uh, this in Germany, so uh, um, before we start in showing you a dish that is very uh, uh, representative for our restaurant, I would like to present you uh, our restaurant and, and the group that we are part of. So I would like to start a little uh, presentation. So um, there we go. So um, I have been uh, with Amber uh, Restaurant and actually with the group uh, for, uh, since 2005. And, uh, um, I joined the group one year prior to the opening of the hotel, and uh, it was definitely uh, a great uh, sense of public curiosity when we opened a second hotel in Hong Kong, um, as Hong Kong is known for, of course, the legend, which is the Mandarin Oriental. And when Mandarin decided to do a second hotel in, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, people were very curious and uh, wanted to understand what it was all about. So uh, the Mandarin Oriental is, is definitely a legendary property, and it's always among the five very best restaurants in the world, or hotels in the world, sorry. And um, having various restaurants of very high caliber, um, such as the Mandarin Grill and Manwa, and uh, restaurants that are based on decades of tradition. Um, so when we opened the landmark Mandarin Oriental um, in the same city, another new hotel, it was very important that we position the hotel and the restaurants uh, in a totally different manner. Um, what we kept basically when we started to open this uh, hotel is we kept our Mandarin Oriental legendary service, which is what we're known for worldwide. But we also wanted to make sure that the restaurant concepts that we did had design that was really uh, mind-boggling. Um, exciting food properties, of course. Um, and uh, as a new kid on the, blong, the younger, on the block, the youngest sibling, we wanted to take a totally different approach. Um, and even today, people do not realize that we're not just uh, a copy of the Mandarin Oriental. So the Mandarin Oriental Hong Kong um, is a Hong Kong-born uh, uh, hotel group. Uh, Hong Kong is a foodie city, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the city has about, uh, well, between 11,000 and 20,000 restaurants approximately, uh, depending who you believe. Uh, home for 7 million people living in relatively small apartments. So people do eat a tremendous amount outdoor. Uh, the range of restaurants could not be more diverse, uh, from street food noodle bars to world-class fine dining restaurants with exceptional wine cellars. And uh, a lot of the global names have entered in Hong Kong, opening restaurants as it's such a, a thriving food city. So the landmark commander on the Oriental was set as a new, different hotel. We only had 113 keys, unknown for the Mandarin Oriental Hotel Group. Uh, we created for the hotel a platinum fan uh, that was basically a distinguishment from the existing golden fan in the previous hotel. Uh, in the hotel, we have an exceptionally high ratio of staff to guest uh, in order to obtain extremely personalized service. Uh, in the F&B, we really wanted to make sure that we have very strong points of differences to be able to compete in a rather traditional city of Hong Kong. So you see this beautiful building, uh, very modern, very elegant, in the middle of downtown. And then, of course, we have the restaurant, uh, our spectacular dining room, uh, very striking design by Adam Tihan, who also designed, per se, in New York for Thomas Keller. Um, the, in that, the, 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 the designed intent was to uh, bring back the golden Art Deco days of Hong Kong. And uh, um, I do think that Adam was able to give the room a feel that is actually very, very in today's sort of picture and also restaurant design that really matters. I just wanted to make sure um, that I introduce myself. I'm a Hong Kong chef, but I was Dutch born. Um, I grew up actually in a province uh, of Zeeland, which is actually quite well known as various very well-known chefs in, in Germany uh, uh, or chefs in Holland from this region are also known in Germany. Um, I was, uh, I grew up in the restaurant of uh, my grandparents who had a seafood restaurant in Vlissingen and I think to grow up um, as a young man in a fisher village uh, really grow up, uh, grow a very strong foundation for me uh, and it's something that I still use as a chef. Uh, I really enjoyed helping with my parents uh, and my grandparents in the restaurants and I think that became a very strong and important uh, part of my apprentice scheme. Um, I actually need to confess something. I'm Dutch, but I'm also a Francophile. Uh, I'm probably, as the French say, more French than the French, as I spent uh, the largest part of my career in France. Um, 
In addition, I do love wine. I'm a big line, uh, uh, wine uh, lover, and uh, uh, wine has a very important impo uh, component in, in our restaurant. And whenever we do a dish, we, we take that very strongly in, into consideration. Uh, my personal favorites are definitely the Burgundy and the Rhone, and uh, that is definitely what is reflected on our wine list as well. So um, from there, actually, I, I have been, as mentioned, uh, uh, you know, traveling around the world. I'm, I'm a real global trotter, um, always looking for exciting food-driven uh, experiences. And uh, after learning uh, the craft under some of the finest chefs in Holland, uh, I left for Belgium, where again, I was very fortunate to work with great chefs. From there, I left to France, where I lived, uh, lifted my skill set under a uh, tutelage of four three-star chefs. And uh, from there, I went to Mauritius, uh, a totally different experience and something that absolutely seduced me, the multiculturalism of that island and uh, the magic of spices really, really uh, created even a very broad, a much broader uh, uh, foundation for my cooking. From there, I went to another island, Barbados, um, which confirmed basically the love that I have for islands. And from ba Barbados to another island, uh, a rather more urbanized island, Hong Kong. And this after eight years, um, after Amber was launched, uh, I opened another restaurant in Shanghai, which is called 58 Degree Grill. Uh, and it's at the Mandarin Oriental Pudong, and it's an informal, artisanal, craft-driven restaurant concept that brings together some of the very best elements of French bistro and, and grill, as all preparations are done on open wood fire. And then... Um, I have been working around so many countries and uh, have to build uh, a number of culinary teams uh, along the line. And uh, the team in Amber is absolutely very international, although my two assistants are definitely 100% Hong Kong Chinese. Um, we have uh, over 50 requests a week of people joining us, so our kitchen is a little United Nations, a little culinary United Nations. Uh, we have fostered, or I have fostered over the time, a set of values that I expect my team to keep in mind constantly when we, uh, we are operating our restaurants is that I expect the staff to be extremely driven. I expect them to be extremely passionate about what we do, to, to have the desire to do well what we do and to be consistently well in what we do, to have a mutual respect to each and each other but also towards the products that we're using, to be very precise and more important, to be skilled. Skills is something that is a foundation uh, that is very important in our kitchen. It's a very craft-driven uh, kitchen that we try to bring. And one of my favorite sayings is, uh, to break the rules, you first need to master them. Uh, I think that it is something that is on the wall in our kitchen and, and a constant reminder to us to make sure that we are uh, a skilled bunch of people. From there, um, I went to France, and in France, I really gained a profound love for cooking. I need to be very honest, and it's unfortunate for the French, I did not learn how to cook. I was very fortunate to work with some very, very uh, capable chefs prior. But um, I, what I really took was the great admiration that they had in their terroir. And for me, season and climate are very important to that, what we serve and how we cook on a daily basis. Another great source of inspiration for me is very unexpected. It actually comes from a luxury brand, one of the most established luxury brands, and, uh, which is called Hermes. Uh, I think Hermes is one of the most finest and established luxury brands. It uses only the finest fabrics combined with the best craftsmanship. A brand that maintains classicism, yet in every collection they bring in modern touches to make sure that their brand is evolving, which ensures that the brand is never dated. Um, that is something that is always in the back of my mind whenever we do something in Amber. In Amber, we take full advantage of... Uh, French culinary sensibility, while some utilizing uh, the very best Asian products. In Hong Kong, we are on a very interesting crossroads. We can source products from Europe, from Australia, and from Japan. Um, I particularly enjoy working with Japanese ingredients, and not so much the Japanese uh, flavor profile, but the ingredients, because uh, it is really a matter of proximity and a matter of choice, because it's so close to us, and we have daily flights every morning coming from Japan, delivering us ingredients that are exceptional and have been handled and grown in exceptional manners. And then, of course, you know, we're looking uh, every day, as, as many of our restaurateurs, in uh, ensuring that we're getting better and trying
trying to exceed what we're doing today of what we did yesterday and setting the bar daily a little bit higher uh, uh, is our ultimate goal, uh, to make guests come back and, and happy. Um, the ultimate cherry on the cake is, is the awards. Um, and we have uh, gained um, um, two Michelin stars and have maintained them since the arrival of the guide in Hong Kong for five years. Um, we have been selected uh, for the past three years in the world's 50 best restaurants by San Pellegrino and uh, very proud to be the best restaurant in China uh, to be on the list. Um, as mentioned, wine is a very important place, so another one that we're happy about is the, the Wine Spectator that has consistently awarded the best award of excellence to our seller. So we do appreciate these uh, accolades and we recommend you know, how important these are uh, for, and, and the commercial value that they have for our property. So, um, enough talking uh, about our restaurant. I just wanted to make sure that uh, you had an idea and we're sort of setting the tone for what we're going to show you now. But, um, you know, um, sort of the end of the uh, introduction that we had on the, on the, on the Mandarin and on uh, the landmark Mandarin and, and Amber. So picture yourself in this beautiful dining room designed by Adam Tiani. And uh, with my team, Kay and Basil, who are with me, we're going to demonstrate you a dish that, that basically embodies um, what we do uh, in, uh, in Amber. Um, if you look at to all the chefs and even now, you see um, a lot of Asian ingredients and Asian flavors coming back to, to German, French, and English foods. And it's, uh, it is a form um, that uh, for us does not work. Our clientele is 85% uh, Chinese, and we need to make sure that the uh, Exotic part is to maintain very faithful to the French flavor profile. What we do differently is that we integrate certain in, uh, ingredients from the region, of course, Japan uh, in particular, and uh, treat them in a very French manner. Um, what we particularly love in Amber is uh, combinations of land and the sea. Uh, I was born in Zeeland, as I mentioned, and uh, I love the combination of having meats with seafoods, um, vegetables from the land with fish and so on. So um, this is something that really works in our restaurants. Uh, and also, if you look into Cantonese foods, uh, there's many examples in Cantonese and Hong Kong food of land and sea combination. If you eat dim sum, it's uh, created from shrimp and pork or chicken and squid. So this is something in which we bring basically um, a comfort bridge to our Chinese guests. So we cooking very French, but yet we have a certain uh, 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 concept that we use, which is very familiar to them. So what we're going to um, show you as a dish is lamb. Uh, it's a salt marsh lamb. So it's a lamb that grazes on the shores uh, um, uh, nearby the sea. And we combine that with sea urchin. Um, very unusual combination uh, if you would take a European sea urchin with that. What we use is Hokkaido sea urchin, which basically is extremely sweet and creamy and, and has uh, an absolute beautiful refined taste. And we combine that with a seaweed sabayon and shore vegetables. So all vegetables that are growing on the shore. So what we use uh, for the dish, we have uh, a lamb that we have, uh, basically we have uh, removed the loins of the panoufle and uh, cleaned the panoufle very thin, uh, rolled it up, the loins into the panoufle, and um, um, then truss it and, and, and vacuum packed it with a little bit of uh, kombu seaweed. Um, we cook this um, vacuum um, um, up at 65 degrees, and um, we do that until we re achieve the core uh, temperature of 48 degrees, so it's perfectly medium rare. Um, we have made a sabayon, a sabayon made from uh, champagne vinegar, lemon vinegar, uh, eggs, egg yolks, and salted, salted clarified butter, and a little bit of seaweed. And um, we have made some buckwheat twills, again, which really works well with that, uh, out of flour and with a little bit of squid ink. Uh, we made a smoked potato mousseline that basically works as a gelling agent with regards to the flavors. Um, then uh, the sea urchins, we already brought them from, uh, already prepared, but we get them normally in the shell. Uh, so the beautiful tongs are set out on this beautiful tray. So Hokkaido sea urchin uh, that we're going to use. Then. Um, we use all different shore vegetables. So we have salicornia, we have oyster leaf, we have uh, salsola, 
And these vegetables, we're all going to uh, implement in the dish and, and create, create different levels of, uh, of, of, of brine, of saltiness. Then we made a very nice lamb jus that uh, we uh, made of a lot of meat and uh, very little bones, actually. We use very little bones in our jus, and we infuse that with kombu for about 50 minutes. Uh, we're going to take it out now, and we're going to add some uh, bonito flakes. Uh, and what you just get is these beautiful unami flakes, umami flakes that work very well with the lamb that comes from the same uh, seaside and with the, the sea urchins. So uh, after we infuse that for, for 50 minutes, we add uh, the uh, uh, bonito flakes. We're going to leave that to infuse, uh, covered. Um, along with this, we have taken some very nice waxy potatoes. We made a dashi, uh, again from kombu and bonito flakes. And we have cooked these potatoes, very waxy potatoes, in the dashi. And um, these waxy potatoes we have rolled in fresh wakame, seed, uh, wakame leaf uh, seaweed from, uh, from Japan. So the wakame we use, we get daily fresh from Japan. And uh, uh, it, it's an exceptional taste component, but also an exceptional texture component. Um, there's no culture in the world that is as sens uh, sensitive to texture as the Chinese. Uh, the Chinese very often compliment us on texture and not always on flavor. So it's a very important component in the dish. So um, these potatoes, very waxy, rolled into wakame. We place them on the plate randomly. In between that, we have the oyster leaves that we have uh, blanched very shortly, that we place in between. And oyster leaves, well, they uh, have this beautiful taste of the sea that is very elegant. Um, along with this, we made a mousseline of potato, and what we did is, instead of uh, just using butter, we smoked the butter, because the smoky bus, smoking is really uh, uh, well, particularly with uh, the bonito flakes, but had that same smokiness. So we're adding some um, small dots of potato. Like that. And then we have uh, roasted some onions uh, in the shell on the, on the green egg, so you get that very beautiful grilled taste. And those onion shells, we place them uh, in between. Then we have the twills of the, the buckwheat. It's basically a mix of uh, buckwheat flour with uh, a little bit of squid, ink, and uh, olive oil, and uh, dashi and we place them randomly between, and that gives uh, a crispy, crispy note in the dish. Uh, I always like that crispiness in a dish, so we're always looking to, uh, to add something crispy in a, in a dish. Okay, then we have these beautiful uh, leaves, all from uh, you know, salty leaves, as I call them, or briny leaves. We add them in between. So it gives a very nice feel to the dish. A um, little bit of salicornia we also add. I love salicornia. As a kid, I grew up in, uh, in Zeeland, and I would go and, uh, and look for it in the summer and in the spring. Uh, and it's something very special. I, I love the taste. It reminds me of home. So the lamb, we have cooked it, so perfectly uh, pink. Uh, we have uh, uh, cut it in two. So we give it a, a little bit of, uh, of sea salt just in the center. It has been seasoned slightly by the wakame. Um, we have um, these beautiful um, sea urchins that we're going to add on top, along with some salicornia to create some texture.
It's a very unusual combination to eat sea urchin with lamb, but I, I, I truly believe that it is a, a very interesting uh, combination, not only in terms of taste, but also in terms of texture, as it really complements each other. Okay. So, on top of that, uh, a little bit of uh, Japanese citrus. It's not yuzu, it's kabuzu, and a little bit of organic lemon. I really like the perfume of that, and it really uh, gives it a, a nice fragrance. What I forgot to put on, on the garnish, actually, is a little bit of sea grapes that, uh, that we bring in from Japan. Uh, I love that sort of popping texture when you eat this. So a little bit of sea grapes that we're going to add also. All right. So um, the sabayon seaweed so we're going to top that off and basically the sabayon what what the, the function that it is it basically lingers and it gives a certain level of creaminess that is very pleasant but also an acidity that the dish needs so we put a little bit of sabayon on both and then a little bit of dolce seaweed on top okay and then we place these little lamb medallions next to the garnish okay and then uh, the jus has been passed so it's the jus as i mentioned beautiful lamb jus of meat but it has been infused with the kombu and the bonita flakes uh, to build that bridge between the seafood so the surf and turf and the meat uh, we have finished it with a little bit of fresh lemon juice at the end and we're going to add just some drops of sauce randomly around the dish. So that is uh, basically the dish that I wanted to show you and uh, uh, a representation of the land and the sea um, uh, and a representation of where I come from but also what people really enjoy in Hong Kong. Thank you very much.